open source intelligence is the collection and analysis of data gathered from open sources, like public records, but also other sources. In recent years, it's become a pivotal, pivotal source of information for investigative journalists. OSINT data has been used to track military activity in countries like Russia and Yemen, uncover the travel of internationally sanctioned individuals, and reveal war crimes, among sure. other uses. So Bell and Cat is an investigative journalism group that is on the forefront of using OSINT for investigative reporting today. Their investigations have pioneered the use of OSINT to point to Russian involvement in the shooting down of Malaysian flight MH17 over Ukraine in 2014. They provided evidence on the use of chemical weapons by the Syrian government against civilians during the country's civil war. And they've revealed the massacre of civilians by Cameroonian soldiers, to name just a few investigations. Bellingcat has received numerous awards for its work, including two Emmys alongside CNN for their investigations into the poisoning of Russian opposition leader, former Russian opposition leader, unfortunately now dead, Alexei Navalny. And they are also the recipients of ICFJ's 2022 Innovation, Innovation in International Reporting Award. In this session, I'm really happy to introduce Owen McGuire. Owen is the lead editor at Bellingcat, where he holds the team of editors and social media producers uh, which heads the team of editors and social media producers, while also working with dozens of investigators to bring, to bring stories of significant public interest around the world to light. Today, he's going to walk us through how OSINT can be used in an African context, the fundamentals of OSINT intelligence for investigative reporters, and more. So Owen, welcome to the IGNET Pamela Howard Forum on Crisis Reporting, and I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit more. Thank you, Devin. Really appreciate it. So hello, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Devin, for asking me to join. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll give a little bit of a brief explanation about, about Bellingcat, the origins of Bellingcat, and kind of, as Devin's already touched on, the what open source investigations are and, and how open source material can be used in, in journalistic investigations. So um, Bellingcat was was founded in, in 2014. Um, back then, there was just one employee, and that was Elliot Higgins, our founder. And uh, we've since grown to uh, 37 employees, um, which is great for 10 years. Um, we specialize in, in open source investigations or online, sorry, online open source investigations. Now, that's a very broad term. Uh, and to, to give you a few examples, open source material can be images or posts found on social media sites, ship or air traffic ship or aircraft trafficking websites, publicly available satellite imagery, weapons databases, leak data sets, online chat logs, literally anything that can be found um, on the internet. The GIF that you see on the on the right hand side of the screen right now is, is a little example of that. It was an image that was posted to a telegram channel that claimed to show a mass burial in a rural area of Kyrgyzstan uh, and I think in 2021 after police had cracked down on groups protesting the government there. By using Peak Pfizer, which is an online platform built to help mountaineers map out hikes and climbs, uh, which I'll explain a little bit more about later on in this presentation, uh, we were able to confirm that this uh, picture was indeed taken in the area of rural Kyrgyzstan by overlaying the the sort of data of the mountains uh, in this region onto the to photograph uh, that we had to confirm that it was indeed indeed taken there. Um, yeah, so uh, using open source as Devon's kind of kindly touched on in the intro. Using open source, uh, I guess, open source information, we've uncovered and verified lots of potential war crimes in, in uh, uh, Libya, Ethiopia, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, during this presentation, Ukraine, Yemen, Mali, Armenia, and more. Um, we've also uncovered spy networks, state-backed assassination teams, the movements and activities of drug cartel leaders, explored lots of neo-Nazis, some of who, uh, whom are in jail now, um, and sanctions breaches by the likes of Russia, Iran, and, and many, many more. Um, our staff is our staff is small, but our community is large and growing, and we encourage our readers to help us conduct our investigations, which I think is something that's a little bit different from uh, other journalistic outlets or investigative journalism outlets. Um, we think the name Bellingcat comes from the, the Aesop fable, Belling the Cat, or uh, you know, the mice who group together to put a bell on a cat. So with this community of mice that we describe ourselves, we hope we can put the bell on the on the bad guys and let people know that they're coming. So um yeah, that's that's the origins of of, of Belling Cat. Um the image, um, to give an example of, of work with our community, the image on on the on the left hand side of the screen, uh, this shows the results from an AI model that one of our contributors created to identify Russian ships and satellite imagery that were attempting to get around sanctions by exchanging oil and other cargo, such as grain at sea, to disguise the fact that 
uh, it had come from Russia and Ukraine to so therefore to uh, uh, infiltrate into the the global market. Um, as this is a, a a presentation about how these methods can be used in an African context, though I've I've got a couple of examples to show you now uh, about how we um, yeah how we how we worked on on uh, some Africa or investigations that touched on Africa. Um, I have to warn you though that um, the first example uh, that I'm going to share um, will contain graphic footage and material, so please prepare yourself for that. And if this is not something that you want to see or hear or uh, are comfortable with, now is the time to, to stop watching or, or listening. So I'll give you anyone a second who wants to leave can can, can do so. Oh, and before we start, um, can I have everyone please send like a heart or a thumbs up if you can see the presentation that he's doing and hear us. Okay. Just to make sure that the tech issues are okay. It looks like we're good. All right. Sounds good. Okay. That's a lot of hearts and thumbs up. So a lot of people here. Okay, great. Um, so uh, in early March of 2021, uh, videos began surfacing on social media claiming to show the execution of civilians somewhere in Tigray, Ethiopia. This was during the war between Ethiopia's government forces and forces in the Tigray region. I'm sure many people who are on this on this call have, have, have uh, done work on this subject or reported on this subject matter. The videos were extremely graphic and uh, grainy. Um, but they showed a group of people being rounded up by soldiers, marched towards the edge of a cliff, and then being executed before their bodies were pushed over the edge. Um, even though these, I mean, these were these were tough videos to watch, not particularly nice content, or horrible content, um, but they did contain clues that allowed Bellingcat, working with Scripps News and the BBC, to verify and report those uh, two very important uh, journalistic facets, where and who. Um, so. First of all, where um, unverified online claims detailed that uh, videos were taken near a town called Machberi Dago. Uh, I'm sorry if I've uh, got the pronunciation of that wrong, if there's anyone in here who knows exactly how you say that. Um, it was not possible to confirm from watching the videos themselves that uh, the videos were indeed taken there. There was no towns or, visible, uh, towns or buildings visible in the footage. Uh, to confirm this. So usually in these circumstances, Google Street View or, or Google Maps is the open source investigator's friend uh, when trying to discover where a, a video or photo was taken. But these tools, as incredibly useful as they are, uh, they offer far less detailed data about rural areas. So this meant that we had to uh, look for more subtle clues. So we began by just trying to gather is just what do we notice in the in the in the, in the videos themselves, um, and among the the early information that we were able to gather were uh, we established that the video was taken either early in the morning or early in the evening. We could establish this because the individuals that you could see in the video they cast relatively long shadows, so this would mean that they were uh, uh, the shadows because either in the morning or the evening, the shadows were being cast in either an easterly or western direction. That might seem small, but it would become important later on when we uh, tried to confirm some further details. Uh, the landscape itself also gave away some more clues. Um, so for example, in the, in the images you can see here, uh, we can see what appears to be a ridge and a ravine, uh, as well as a plateau where the video appears to be taken. Uh, with some mountains in the background. These are highlighted by the, yeah, so the, the uh, the ridge highlighted by the um, the blue lines and the cliff edge with the yellow line. Uh, if we were correct that the visible shadows in the last slide that I showed you were facing east-west, then that would mean that the direction the camera would be pointing towards, towards the cliff edge, would be either to the north or the south. The next challenge was to discover where a camera pointing in a northerly or southerly direction could view a landscape like the one we'd seen in the video. Uh, Given the obvious place that seemed the place that it seemed most obvious to start, uh, given the online claims about the the village of Machberi Dago, the area around there seemed like a good place to start. Again, this was a rural and mountainous region, but uh, analysis of of Google Maps and satellite imagery suggested, or so overhead satellite imagery, school satellite imagery to be exact, uh, suggested there were potential candidates uh, close by to that village. Uh, it was then a process of manually searching these areas via Google Earth, something that took a few days to do given the wide area to cover. Um, but luckily, we found a few candidates where there was potentially a match. Uh, unfortunately, the imagery just wasn't sharp and detailed enough for us to be confident um, that we had found a match and we'd found the exact place. But it still provided some useful clues and narrowed down sites for us to try and verify uh, using other, other methods and tools. 
So going back to Peakvisor, which I introduced you to uh, in the, the first slide, um, we turned to we turned to Peakvisor, which was initially it's an amazing tool, um, and I'd be happy to speak to anyone about Peakvisor because it's helped us in so many investigations. Uh, it was initially designed for hill workers and mountaineers, and it states on its website uh, that and its app that it has a global record of, of over a million mountains around the world. So data on the shape and the unique little details about about mountains around the world. Uh, it's designed for hill workers and climbers, not open source investigators, but. Uh, a happy coincidence uh, by creating this tool is that it really does help us find uh, where videos and photos are taken in, in rural locations. Um, again, so the initial results um, from the locations we suspected from our Google search, they did appear promising. Uh, you can see the ridge line there in, in yellow kind of drifting down. That seemed to match. Um, and as the, the mountain range in the background, the, the, the video wasn't exactly sharp enough to to confirm that, um, but yeah, the, you can see in the, I'm pointing here, but I don't know why I'm pointing because you can't see me pointing, uh, but the kind of the gap in the in the red line uh, in, the, in the horizon also kind of matched where, uh, yeah, you would you would see that gap in the video. So we we decided to see if we could match the, the mountains in the background uh, for further confirmation. Um, Sorry, Owen, we'll have a few questions if you could repeat the name of the app that you use? Oh, sorry, uh, Peak Pfizer. So it's uh, spelt P-E-A-K-V-I-S-O-R, all one word. Um, so peakvisor.com, or if you go on the uh, Google Play Store or Apple Store and just type in Peak Pfizer, then you'll be able to, to find it. It's amazing. It's so cool. If you want to go hill walking, it's also useful as well. But yeah, this is a journalism talk. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so we we decided okay, could could we see if we could match up the the, the mountains that were supposed to be there or that would be there in the background? Um, we tried to sharpen the image a little bit, and it did seem to it did seem to line up. Um, you know the same sort of indentation there uh, in the in the red box and then the blue box, the the hills and kind of peaks you could see in the in the in the background. Um, yeah, so when we pulled all this together, compared what we could see on Peak Pfizer, we felt that we could be confident that this was indeed a match. Uh, what's more, um, going back to one of the earliest uh, earliest uh, things we noticed in the video about the shadows going east-west, and then if the shadows were going east-west, then the camera would be uh, facing north-south. That matched exactly up with where... Um, yeah, so this this view would be looking north south um, from the camera, uh, and that matched up exactly where the mountains would be in the background. So we felt pretty confident at that point. The, uh, like I said, I think I think I mentioned before there were there were five videos that were released, um, uh, or that uh, became that were posted online that, that showed this incident, uh, and we um, were able to 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 look at the 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 background and the and, and the ridge lines and the. The the you know, the appearance of the land and, and match up these videos to you know uh, an area around where uh, the eventual executions took place and it was indeed just outside the village of Mahberidego as as people had been uh, reporting online. So with that, it was now about we had the where so how about the who? Um, now we knew that we knew this yeah we knew where the event took place so. Um, or uh, deciding or figuring out exactly who uh, was responsible again, a not insignificant task. But there were clues within the videos that allowed us to allowed us to to dig in. Uh, the first and the most obvious clue was the language being used in the videos. Uh, none of us. So there was there was three people um, from Bellingcat. Uh, well, one from Bellingcat, uh, and one from Scripps News, and one from the BBC. Uh, Giancarlo Fiorella. Uh, who uh, works for Bellingcat, is now our um, Director of, of uh, Research and Training. Jake Gordon, who at the time was working for Newsy, but now is now a Senior Investigator at Bellingcat, and Alium Leroy, who, who works for the BBC. Um, so again, really talented and incredible people, but none of them spoke the language that, that was in the video. So we we reached out to um, some uh, Amharic speakers and some uh, Tigrayan speakers to see, okay, what what uh, is being said in these videos and, and um, you know, uh, can you give us a transcript, break down exactly what's being said, what other clues can we find from the from the audio. Um, so uh, working with independent translators, they told us that the soldiers were speaking Amharic um, with accents that suggest it would have been their first language. So, you know, using a lot of slang words um, 
not broken, uh, not not broken kind of words, uh, very fluent. Um, this was important as it made it less likely that the perpetrators would have been Tigrayans or, or even Eritreans who were attacking Tigrayan territory from the north at that time. Our next clue um, was by zooming in uh, on the uniforms um, worn by uh, those who could be seen in the videos looking over or, or standing guard, I guess, over over the, the civilians who were, or the, the people in civilian clothes who were sat down in front of them. Uh, we looked at the the camouflage patterns of the of of the the individuals in the video, and that would have been consistent with the Ethiopian army. But we wanted something. We wanted more than that, and we found on one uh, individual there was a, a flag patch on the on the right arm. Um, and zoomed in, you could see what did appear to be colours and a symbol consistent with the Ethiopian flag. Uh, that we, we we took that uh, still image and then we looked for other videos online, so just on YouTube, um, for uh, uh, videos of of, of uh, Ethiopian soldiers um, going about their business. Uh, 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 just uh, yeah, other videos that were online that would show people in in uniform, and we found that yeah, that was a common a common patch that that Ethiopian soldiers would wear. Um, so again, it's all pointing in the one direction: the language, the the, the uniforms, the the patch on the the patch on the on the arm. Again, using the you, we, we, the, with this particular video. Sorry, I should have mentioned that with this particular video that that did show the soldiers uh, close up. Um, it was we we used the same geolocation techniques. Uh, we used peak visor again. Everything lined up. It was in the same area close to Machberi Dago, but it was around about a kilometre away from where the execution video was taken. So we did. Um, consider that it might have been, um, and just warning, there's a, a graphic image in the, in the next slide. We did consider that um, this could have been a separate incident, perhaps, um, but by honing in on some of the individuals who are, are the civilians uh, and the items of clothing they could wear, we could see that some people appear to be you know, the, the same clothing, the same kind of very distinct clothing, including one individual who had this... Um, a scarf, I guess, uh, around around their head and around their neck, uh, a red t-shirt, uh, another individual with with an orange t-shirt, and and other people who had items that, that matched the people who were eventually marched to the edge of the cliff um, and executed. Um, yeah, uh, there was even as you can see the video on the left there again. It's that's we've blurred it because it's not a nice image at all. Um, the yeah that that person uh, was filmed after they were after they were shot dead. So again, we were we were. With all of that, we were very confident that this was a, um, a video that was, these were a series of videos that were shot and filmed outside the village of Machberidego in Tigray, Ethiopia. Um, and we were, with all the evidence that we had, we were also very confident that this was um, uh, Ethiopian soldiers and the Ethiopian military who had who'd carried out these executions. We did try to look into the exactly when um, these videos were taken. Uh, there was there was satellite imagery that uh, in January, so a couple of months before they were posted online, um, the, there was satellite imagery that showed what appeared to be military vehicles in this area, all lined up, and you can see even you know on the on the right hand side, it appears to be some soldiers uh, or, or uh, military equipment um, there. Um, so potentially, but we didn't feel confident enough to say that yes, that was indeed. Um, the exact time um, when these executions occurred, but um, yeah, what we what we were able to confirm was the the where and the who. So we reported that, the BBC reported it, um, and and Scripps News reported it as well. Um, yeah, it was a it was a, a tough story to do, but we felt it was a an important one, and it, um, yeah, it, it it was important information to put out there. I think, um, yeah, so. Again, so we were we were the first ones we were the first ones who who reported this. Uh, a couple of weeks later, um, CNN, Al Jazeera, Amnesty International all released their own reports, and they all found similar to what we did, which was good for us. Um, uh, yeah, and they all they used they we used we used our methods, and they used their methods. Some of which were more complicated and probably cost a lot, lot more money than we did because ours were all free. Um, but yeah, um, so one of the one of the again, and I hope this is what people take away, or one of the things that I hope people take away from, from this presentation is that 
this inve- that, so this which was a what I think was a really important investigation and and was really strong journalistic work. It used freely available online tools such as Google Earth, uh, Google Maps, and Peak Visor. Um, again, just with those with uh, and YouTube as well. Um, so with those with those simple online tools, we were able to do something really really powerful. Um, yeah, uh, as the next point says, also looked for existing online source material to find the uniforms worn by the Ethiopian soldiers using uh, YouTube videos, which anyone can do. Um, the tools, you know, even Peak Visor and, and, and Google Map and, and Google Earth Pro, you know, they're important, but, and it wouldn't have been possible to do this investigation without them. But I think another thing that I hope people take away from this is that it's really lateral thinking and problem solve a problem solving mindset that allowed us to do this investigation. It was seeing what was possible with the information and the tools available. So just investigative work, just a different way of doing investigative work than maybe journalists have been thinking maybe uh, before the kind of open source investigations world came along. Um, again, another really key point that I want to emphasize um, with this with this presentation is that you don't have to be a tech wizard to conduct open source investigations or spend lots of money. All the tools we use were free. Um, but there are also some paid tools you can use. And I'm going to give you another example that touches on the African context. It's an example that touches on three continents. And it's also um, goes back to the second slide where I showed you the ships um, that were uh, doing ship to ship transfers at sea to disguise the fact that they'd been to occupied Ukrainian ports and were likely uh, taking uh, or exporting uh, grain that had been taken from Eastern Ukraine, which is occupied territory and then filtered into the, the global economy. Um, so, yeah, so this was this was a, a story we did in June this year. And it was it was one it was a story we'd, we'd been looking at this issue um since the start the start of the war in ukraine um looking at ships that were coming into this port and occupied crimea and sevastopol now you can see in the top right of the image what are grain silos and then the ship there uh docked um ready to take on grain that comes from those silos um there's been lots of work done by the bbc by the new york times by the washington post by the wall street journal about um grain coming from occupied areas of eastern Ukraine and going out through ports in occupied Crimea. So yeah, this was all this has all been widely reported before. Uh we sort of came to this story when we figured out a ship that we'd been tracking previously had again docked in Sevastopol. And I was like, hmm, I wonder what it's up to. So uh, it turned out that um this ship, which is called Zafar, uh had turned off its uh or had, had gone to uh, Sevastopol, loaded up on grain, uh, it had then uh, gone to Yemen via a UN, in, uh, a UN inspection body in Djibouti. So this obviously raises a lot of questions about the effectiveness, effectiveness of sanctions, but then also UN inspections in Djibouti. Um, so we were able to tell this story using Planet Lab satellite imagery. So that what you're looking at right now is a, a Planet Lab satellite image. Um, taken of uh, the port of Sevastopol in Crimea, um, and also using data tracking ship tracking data from Lloyd's List Intelligence, which provides maritime data around the the position of ships. And, and Lloyd's List Intelligence they also have a a publishing arm, uh, a, a, a publication called Lloyd's List, which is one of the oldest shipping publications in the world. It's like 130 years old. Um, so we worked with them, and and they were a a partner in uh, publishing this story. So I'll begin to tell you how we did it. So first, we were able to identify that uh, the ship Zafar had visited the grain terminal uh, in Sevastopol in Crimea to load up on grain. Uh, it switched off what's known as its AIS tracking device. Now, the AIS tracking device is something that all ships are mandated to keep on while at sea. Uh, if a ship turns off its AIS tracking, it's usually for a couple of things. It's usually it's at a risk of piracy. It's broken or it's doing something that it maybe shouldn't be doing. And in this case, it was probably because it was doing something that it should not have been doing. Um, so the ship turned off its AIS. So for all intents and purposes, if you used ship tracking uh, websites like Marine Traffic or even Lloyd's List or Vessel Finder, you wouldn't have been able to look like there was nothing happening at the port of Sevastopol. But if you looked on satellite imagery, you would get a very different story. You would see a ship where no ship was supposed to be, and that ship was loading up on grain. Um, this matched our previous investigation, and we knew we were all already interested in Zafar because we tracked it taking grain from occupied Ukraine to Iran. 
Um, so uh, after figuring out, um, you know, Zafar might be there, we, we got the satellite imagery. And as you can see, we're comparing uh, the image, uh, the planet image, the planet satellite image to uh, imagery uh, taken from ship spotting websites. So that's all publicly and freely available. So the bottom image is a, an image of Zafar. And the top images show you um, so far at the port of Sebastopol. And the, the, the comparison is between, um, uh, we can see the, the arrows going um, between the ships. That's between an earlier investigation where we uh, identified so far on the left and then the later picture uh, where it was there uh, in May or April um, this year. Uh, so we could tell that it was there again. And I, I don't know if you can see, so you can see on the bottom uh, in the bottom image, the word shipping spelled out across the side of the vessel. The green square, I don't know if, if, if everyone can see if it's big enough, the green square uh, in the images above actually shows the same word shipping. Uh, you can see the same yellow cranes, the, the life craft is in the same position. The Yeah, the, the, the colours are all the same as well. Uh, the same number of, the, same, the, the length of the ship, the width of the ship is exactly the same. Uh, the chimneys, the, the chimneys, the exact same colour, everything matches up, so... Uh, we were confident that Zafar had been uh, in uh, Sevastopol again and it had been picking up rain again. Next, after that, I was like, okay, where's it going? Let's 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 follow it. Um, so what these ships tend to do after going to Sevastopol is they go out into the Black Sea and they either exchange that cargo at sea uh, and that cargo that's exchanged onto another vessel goes to the port, so therefore the grain's completely integrated into the, into the global economy. Or uh, it turns on its um, AIS again. So it's like, look, look at me, I'm back. I've, I've just been here, sitting here. Uh, and now I'm going to go to my destination. So Zafar was one of the latter and it, it started to make its move. Um, and we tracked it through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, into the Red Sea where it stopped in Djibouti. Um, and Djibouti, again, for, for all goods going into Houthi controlled parts of Yemen, uh, they must be inspected in, in Djibouti by the UN Verification and, and Inspection Mechanism for Yemen. And we called them up and they confirmed that, yeah, this all happened, that Safar had gone through um, gone through this process. Uh, when we asked them, did you know where it came from? We never got a response. Um, and that might be because of what we discovered. Um, but it does, the fact that this had happened, you know, it's important that, that food goes through into into Yemen, you know that that's that's really really important, um. But it does create a situation where a UN body has waved through a grain shipment from occupied Ukraine, despite Ukraine being a UN member and despite UN nations repeatedly voting to protest Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So that seemed like quite an important point to, or quite an important story to to tell. Um. Yeah. So again, the the ship arrives in Djibouti with its AIS switched on. Uh, satellite imagery showed it there as well. Um, we were really confident and comfortable with exactly what we'd found. Again, all open source information, um, even though we'd used a paid pl platform in Planet and we'd been given access to Lloyd's List. And then a couple of days later, after, after it had been in Djibouti, uh, it, it moved on to Hodeida um, and we could see it docked there. Again, uh, the measurements, everything matched up exactly. Um, I, you can see the trucks there. There's a kind of yellowy substance around them. It looks like grain. Um, so yeah, it appeared the shipment had been completed. And um, yeah, we, we felt we had our story. So we published that um, on our website in, in, in June. And it's also, not to give too much away, it's also something we're still following and still tracking. So yeah. If anyone, one actually, one thing I should add: uh, if anyone wants to wants to reach out and and talk about stories like these um, with us at Bellingcat, we're always open to that because a big part of what we do is partnership um, and sharing the method that we have because we think um, it's it's really important and um, serves journalism better and it serves societies better if if journalists have these tools at their disposal and can you know we can help people learn this. That's that's really important to us. So. Um, if anyone wants to 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 reach out afterwards, um, I can share my my email address. It's Owen E O G H A N at Bellingcat .com, and I'm sure Devin can share that as well. So yeah, um, so this has gone much quicker than I thought. So we might have even thirty minutes for for questions. So I've got one more slide just to talk about the the challenges and opportunities in open source research because it's it's still a, a I mean Bellingcat's been going for ten years, but it's still a relatively new field. But even though it's a relatively new field. Um, an increasing number of publications are seeing the possibility of of what's 
what you can do with open source investigations. The New York Times has won Pulitzer Prizes for open source investigations that they've done now. The Washington Post is, has their own um, visual investigations department. So does the BBC. BBC Verify is a really big thing um, for them now. CNN has their, their visual investigations team, the Financial Times as well, and, and lots, lots more. Um, yeah, an increasing number of publications see the possibility and the power uh, of what you can achieve with this. Uh, one again, I want to stress so much, and I think it's really important that everyone knows this, is that those organisations that I just mentioned have massive budgets. We at Bellingcat do not have a massive budget. Um, all our financials are available on our website, including all our donations and everything and um, and where our money goes. But um, yeah, the cost of doing open source investigations doesn't have to be massive, doesn't have to be high. Our budget is 3.8 million euros a, a year, and we've got a staff of, I know that says 35, but it's now 37 um, so, you know, I think what we deliver with that staff is, is quite impressive. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, lateral thinking and ingenuity that, that helps us do that. Um, it's not just media where, where open source data can be of use. It can be a powerful educational tool and uh, work has also been done, uh, to see how open source evidence can be made permissible in a variety of court settings like the ICC. Um, Again, in terms of challenges, you know, the field's developing all the time. Uh, I mentioned AI at the start of the presentation with um, the, our contributor who made the tool that could automatically pick out uh, ships that were conducting ship-to-ship -ship transfers. And to give you an idea of that, um, he the area that he analysed uh, was an area, it was the same area, but it was, it was um, satellite imagery over the course of a year and a half. So if you put all of those images together, it would have been an area the size of Germany. So instead of looking over that with your uh, your um, uh, magnifying glass, you know that AI tool that that he created just created an incredible opportunity to 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 uh, look at that data really quickly. But then also the the challenges that the changing nature of social media platforms. I'm sure everyone is aware of um, how X or Twitter now X. Has been, you know, that used to be an absolute goldmine for open source information, but now it's now a platform that's since its change of ownership, <laughs> to diplomatically, to say diplomatically, it's it's become much more challenging to find information, and the way that the open source community now operates is much more desperate. Whereas everyone used to be on Twitter, now there's a whole lot of platforms. There's Telegram, there's Blue Sky, there's Reddit, there's YouTube, there's there's loads of different places. So um, yeah, that that creates, you know, that that. Um, scattering of information creates a creates a challenge, um, and it's a it's a you know social media platforms again are changing a lot in terms of I'm sure lots of people in here will know that in terms of distribution and how they engage with their audience, and it's the same for open source uh, information and investigations. The, what they what they highlight and what they what they show to their audience is changing too. So yeah, um, that's a challenge. And AI developments, I, I touched on the positives, but there's also the big unknown. I'm sure lots of people in, in this conversation or in this presentation uh, are thinking about how AI is going to impact, you know, with, with you know, texts that are generated by AI or uh, videos that can be generated by AI in terms of dis and misinformation images as well. The challenge is there when trying to verify things. I, I think we're still at a stage where, to me anyway, um, I know I work for an open source investigative outlet, but to me anyway, when I look at an AI image, I think I can discern what's an AI image and what's not, but AI is improving all the time. So maybe we'll get to a, a stage or a situation where it, it's difficult to tell the difference. So that's the unknown. That's, you know, that's the challenges that are that are to come. Um, but yeah, um, I can only say that that um, I can only encourage people to to try some of the things that, that Bellingcat has uh, or to read some of the the investigations that Bellingcat's done, watch some of the videos we've created, um, learn some of the techniques, even reach out to us to to ask for tips or to 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 partner with us or to engage with us, and we're more than happy to help because the results you can get can be can be yeah really really important. So um, I realise I'm rambling a bit now, Devin. So uh, yeah, well, uh, that's the end well, of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening, everyone, and happy to take any questions. Well, first off, thank you so much for for with this presentation. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone watching has learned a lot. We're going to have a lot of questions coming in. Everyone, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. We're going to do questions for another 20, 25 minutes, depending on what questions we get. Feel free to put them in. Um, as I said, we'll try to get to as many as possible. They can be anything regarding the specifics of either of these investigations, um, OSINT in general, 
anything along those lines. While those come in, I'm curious about this, Owen, and I think people who are following are curious. What was the impact of any of these, of both of these investigations or kind of the follow-up to those? Because um, did they result in, like with Ethiopia, did they result in people um, being able to bring justice mechanisms towards this massacre or anything along those lines? So not yet that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the reporting by the BBC, uh, by, sorry, by, um, that followed up with CNN and Amnesty, they, they felt they were able to identify some of the people as well. Um, in terms of if they've faced any justice, I don't know. Um, if they've not left Ethiopia, I doubt they would have faced justice yet. Um, but yeah, um, with the with the with the <laughs> with the, the ship uh, piece again, that's relatively recent. Um, so we haven't we haven't I, I haven't seen any any impact there. I still see. I look I look on Planet and I look on uh, Lloyd's List all the time. I still see ships going to Sevastopol. Um, it's going to be interesting. We're we're following a few ships and and we're going to uh, hopefully see if the the UN mechanism in, in Djibouti um, has has made any changes uh, um, as well. So that's watch this space. Um, uh, I would I would say though that more generally some of the some of the impact that we've had um, with our investigations. Um, it's yeah. Again, it's and not, not just us. I think other other outlets as well. Um, you know, you mentioned the. Uh, I think you mentioned the anatomy of a killing investigation in Cameroon uh, in your introduction. I know that led to to uh, action against the so. So that was a case that Bellingcat worked on with the BBC, and it, it showed uh, Cameroonian soldiers in northern Cameroon uh, shooting and killing unarmed civilians. And I know that led to 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 um, uh, a reaction in the in the Cameroonian military. So. Yeah, um, there's lots of examples of, of 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 impact with open source reporting. It's really, really powerful. So, yeah. I have three questions, but I'm going to ask both all three of them at the same time because they're more, they're about the last um, case study and they're, they're just more detail orientated. So mm -hmm. the first one was what app was used to track the ship? The second one is how he can get satellite images for specific dates and times. Mm -hmm. And the third one is, how did you track the ship to its destination if the AIS was off? Did they switch it back on after leaving port? So for the last one, yes, they did. They switched it. So they did, they disguised the fact that they're going to port, but then once they leave and then they load up and once they leave port uh, and get, you know, a little bit out into the Black Sea, um, they put their AIS back on. So then that enables us to track it. So to answer the second question, uh, we were able to track it using a platform called Lloyd's List. So Lloyd's List, that's a, that's a paid platform, though, um, but they give us access uh, at Bellingcat. Um, there's other platforms that you can use that give you uh, a free trial. So Marine Traffic is one that gives you a week's free trial. Um, and Vessel Finder, which I believe also gives you a free trial as well. I, so just before I go on to the next uh, platform, uh, I can share it uh, if, if there's... Um, demand for uh, writing all this down, I can write all this down and, and send it to, to, to and anyone who, who who wants it can can um, can have it. Uh, and the final one is a really great platform that I've only just recently become aware of called Global Fishing Watch. Now they do, from what I understand, they've, they've uh, been given a large donation and now they're making a lot of information about, um, you know, ships AIS data that you would previously have had to pay for. They're making a lot of that free. So if you go to globalshippingwatch.com, they've got their their list of tools that um, you can use to, to track ships. So you, you know your ship's name, you go in, you, you type it in, and then it shows you its movements and where it's been over re over recent months. Um, so that's really, really good. And the, what was the first question again, Devin, to work backwards? I forget. Oh, I've already covered it. Was it satellite, satellite imagery? Oh, How do you... correct. How do you, how you can use satellite imagery? How can you sort of specific dates and times for satellite imagery? Yeah, so so there's 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 a few ways. So um, we use well Google Earth, Google Earth Pro. If you go into Google Earth Pro um, or download Google Earth Pro and go into Google Earth Pro, which is free, it shows there's a there's a, a timeline tool and it shows um, you know going back in time how many satellite images of a particular place there may be. Now you you probably have to get lucky if you're looking for something really specific because in terms of their timeline, it's usually an image every you know six months or maybe sometimes a year, sometimes longer than that. Um, there are paid for platforms and there's also free platforms. So uh, Bellingcat uses Planet, uh, Planet Labs a lot. Um, 
they're an amazing company, but we pay an annual fee. But if you are, you know, a journalistic organization or you're an NGO, a lot of the time, if you just maybe they won't appreciate me saying this, <laughs> maybe this should be cut from the recording, but they 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 can be quite generous if you if you um can reach out to them and say, you know, who you are, what you what you want to use a particular image for or search a particular image for, they they can they can they will sometimes share. Um there are other um other platforms like Sentinel Hub, which is part of the European Space Agency, and they um they have a a a free platform. The the image quality is not as good, um, but it's still you know a really really useful resource. So uh, if you go to the Sentinel Hub website, just Google Sentinel Hub and go in, and you can start looking at satellite imagery from various locations. And they I think they say they have complete global coverage, so they photograph every single part of the Earth every six days. So you have a satellite image. Um, it won't be as high quality as you have for Planet or some of the other paid platforms like Maxar or Airbus, but you'll have um, regular satellite imagery in there. We have a lot of questions coming in. So everyone just as a heads up, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I'm gonna try to get to the ones that um, are most applicable for everyone here. Um, while we, there's a lot, there's a lot here. So let's start <laughs> with, um, thank you very much. This is from uh, Olubenga. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation on the vessel tracking investigation. Um, how was AI used to track the movements of the vessel to its destination? Um, at what point do you discover the AIS was switched on and off? So on, on that one, we didn't use AIS. We'd used it, or sorry, um, AI. Um, we, we'd used that for previous investigations to try and just gather how many, or, or understand how many ships had been um exchanging their cargo at sea so when um ships change their cargo at sea they line up beside each other so it looks it looks very unique on satellite imagery and using ai you can train ai if you say okay this this is what this image looks like two ships sat beside each other if you can train an ai to say within this image data set that we have can you please pick out every other incident where a ship was side by side with each other that was something that was that was really useful for us and helped us with that investigation. With the example that I gave, we didn't use AI for that one, um, but we used uh, uh, satellite imagery and, and AIS tracking data. And I forget the second part of the question was when did we when did we use it? So mm. another 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 thing that heightens our suspicion is when you see a ship and it has its AIS tracking data on, and then it switches off for a period of a few weeks, and then it's like, huh, where did that go? Um, and then you can start, you can use satellite imagery to look at ports nearby that maybe it's gone to that it didn't want you to know that it's gone to. And then two, three weeks later, it switches its AIS back on and it's in a position that's very similar to where it disappeared in. But we know that it's actually been to a port and it's hidden the fact that it's been to a port because uh, we had satellite imagery that showed it there. So we, we, I guess we use that as a hint, the fact that the AIS went off and then when it went back on, it was on continuously all the way from the Black Sea through the Mediterranean, through the, the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, all the way to Djibouti and then all the way to Yemen. So we were able to track it all that way. It was just once we had the initial, um, when we spotted the initial gap and it was like, okay, where did it go? Then that was that was the yeah the useful part when it was when it was off. So the fact that the AIS was off was something that aroused our suspicions and made us dig in and investigate a little more. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I have another question here from Sophie Tedling. Um, she asked, um... "Hi, Sophie. <laughs> so the image, sorry, just very quickly, the image that uh, um, we used in the second slide that was actually something that Sophie worked on as well. So Sophie knows a lot about Peak Visor. So if anyone wants to know about Peak Visor, they should ask Sophie." <laughs> she says, "I've worked with Bell and Cat on investigations recently where social media imagery has been manipulated to try to hinder geolocation while still being published publicly." Her question is, do you think AI will be usable as part of the solution for geolocation in these cases? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. Uh, I know I know there's some people who are working on trying to automate geolocation. And I know there's some tools out there. I can't speak to the reliability. Um, but... Yeah, I wish I had a better answer for you, <laughs> Sophie. Um, but that's a really difficult question. I don't, I don't know. I think it's something that we have to be aware of. I think, I think that's something that, um, 
I think that's something that anyone who's doing these investigations has to be aware of. Um, so yeah, I, and I can think of, I can think of, I don't know if it's the same example that she's talking about. I can think of one example where um, AI has been used to obscure, it, it shows half an image and then it's been used to obscure the other half of the image. And all we can tell is that looks like it's, that looks like it's, you know, an image that's been manipulated. So therefore we can't look at the parts that appear to have been manipulated to gain clues from, to gain clues about where it might have been taken. Um, but yeah, that's one particular image, and I hope, uh, yeah, I hope that's not gonna that's not gonna be normal. But maybe there'll be a solution. We'll see. I wish I could give you a better answer, Sophie. I'm sorry. Um, a couple more questions here. Um, this one's more specific, but I think it's interesting because you've been um searching ships. Is this applicable for other contexts? Um, this is from um Delila. Uh, they say, I'm doing an investigation that requires tracking military vehicles, a specific model in African countries, but I can't find any platform to help me with the search. Any suggestions of where to go from there? Yeah, that's tricky because I guess ships and aircraft are slightly different from vehicles because ships and aircraft are mandated to have tracking devices on board. So, um, yeah, uh, ADBS Exchange, uh, Flight Radar 24 are, are really great tools for for tracking aircraft and um uh you know Lloyd's List and, and Global Global Fishing Watch and, and Marine Traffic and Vessel Founder are fantastic for, for tracking ships with via with, with individual vehicles that's that's much trickier because they wouldn't necessarily um have have tracking devices on them. Um I'd love to know more about that question because it sounds really interesting. Um but in terms of in terms of tracking vehicles, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, satellite imagery might be your friend if you know that those vehicles might be in a particular partic particular place at a particular time. Online social media footage as well. Um, trying to geo reference if where social media footage may have been. Um, that that could probably help you. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, if it's uh, unless the vehicles have tracking devices on them, and um, then that might be tricky to tricky to locate them. In the same way that we've done, we did for the for the ship tracking, um, investigations. So I have two questions that go together. One's from Tracy: Is there a shared resource list for sites like Peakvisor or the Marine Shipping Tracker that we can update with sites we've sourced? So is there like a shared area to look for OSINT data? And the other one is from Zoe: Thank you for your presentation. I really love this question. Globally, how can we as journalists train ourselves to maintain our OSINT level? I love those questions. Um, so for the first question, I'm so glad I'm so glad you asked because we've just last week um republished or um organized our uh, online toolkit and that's something that's available to anyone. Um so I'm happy to share that. Um if you go to if you go to bellingcat.com, um you'll be able to see our toolkit on our on our website, uh, on our homepage. Um, it has a huge, humongous list of all the tools um, that we've used and we know what other people have used for, for investigations. There's all sorts of things in there um, that uh, can help in, in, in online investigations. So it's a really great resource. Um, it used to be it used to be just a, sp a spreadsheet that we kept and then we thought we need to do something a bit more organized. Um, so we've now got a, yeah, a really great platform that, that uh, not only... Uh, you know, has the has each resource broken down by you know type, so uh, vessel tracking, aircraft tracking, social media tracking, that type of thing. Um, it, it has a a description um, with uh, benefits and, and drawbacks of each tool as well. So if you go to Bellingcat, Belling, the Bellingcat toolkit, even if you just Google that, you'll you'll probably find it uh, on a Google search. Or if you go to our website, Bellingcat.com, scroll down the page, and there's a a section on the toolkit, and it will it will take you straight there. Um, the second question was, uh, I, I've gone off too much about the toolkit. It was about um, how we how can, can continue to train ourselves on OSINT as journalists. So another one of the one of the other great things about Bellingcat is that we want to share this and share this information as much as possible. And um, if you go, you know, follow us on on YouTube, follow us on Instagram. We always try uh, to to put kind of little tools or games up there that that people can try. You know, geolocation games, that type of thing that that allows you to test yourself. I know there's the uh, quiz time at quiz time on Twitter. I don't know if they're still going, but they do um, geolocation quizzes, which are really useful for you know just honing your skills. Um, the Bellingcat Discord. Um, again, I can send the information of this. The Bellingcat Discord is 
uh, where a lot of our community gather now. Um, so there's 30,000 people in there. Uh, and everyone, people of all different levels, um, people who are just new to open source investigations, people who are really experienced. It's a really collaborative and welcoming place. Um, just people want to help others learn. Um, you can go in there, engage on lots of different techniques, lots of different subject matter and topic areas. It's, yeah, a really you know, lots of cool, vibrant conversations going on in there. So I would encourage everyone to join. And uh, I know that some people who have joined our Discord server uh, so we've got we've got people who 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 go in there and they talk about you know their passion or the topic area that they like to cover, uh, and events happen and they start posting about oh I've just found this I've just found this, and we know that people who work for the New York Times and people who work for CNN and people who work for other publications have come in and seen those conversations and those people have ended up being published, in those publications and also on Bellingcat as well. So we have our staff members are in there, and they're also trying to be welcoming and be encouraging to people and on the occasions where. We start working on something and then people in the community or people who join start working on it with us and it turns into a story that ends up on our website so yeah that's a really great place to, to come and learn and come and come and share there's lots of great tips in there too so um please do join us oh and i know we have a, a sharp cut off at the top of the hour so i think this might be our final question from the audience um considering the increasing surveillance and digital authoritarianism in many african countries how can investigative journalists effectively use look utilize OSINT while mitigating the risk to their own safety and privacy? So that's a really good question and a really important question as well. Um, so using a VPN, really, really important. Trying to, um, uh, yeah, disguise your identity, I guess, a little bit um, so that you can't be tracked. Um, we have a security officer who's, who's really a really invaluable um, part of our team and, and he kind of gives us all the advice on, on what to do, what not to do. Um, we've also got um, uh, guides and articles on our website as well that can that can tell you a little bit more about those types of things. But yeah, VPN for sure. Um, not giving out your name when you don't need to. Um, uh, and um, yeah, uh, yeah, a VPN is the most important. But then also just being just being very careful with who you engage with online. Um, you know, uh, I know a lot of places, lots of places have different standards about how you. You know, you join online groups, you know, some publications will say you have to use your real name. Other publications will be, you know what, it's kind of like you're infiltrating a group. So use a sock puppet account. Um, so that would be an individual decision. That would be down to, you know, if you're working for a publication, what the standards of that publication are. Um, but yeah, uh, I agree. It's something that's really, really important that you've got to, you've got to watch out for. I also say that um, people have been posting and I've been answering them. If you click the answer section of the Q&A, there's all these links, uh, the toolkit link, the tool resources to stay safe. Um, what we'll also do is that, Owen, oh, you'll send me all this information. What we'll do is that we'll send on our IGN at Pamela Howard Facebook page. Um, you just find that on Facebook. If you're not already a member, we'll be able to put all this information down in one link um, and I'll be able to link to that. So keep an eye on that. Owen, this was absolutely incredible. I learned so much. Everyone here did, I'm sure. Um, so my last question, top of the hour, um, how can we, just as journalists, what would you say would be like the next step if someone was just really interested in OSINT, really wanted to get into it, probably doesn't have a background in it or a limited background? What's the first step they should do? Uh, come join the Bellingcat Discord server. Um, follow, follow. you know, if there's if there's journalists who... who do, who do this work on Twitter or journalists who do this work, sorry, who are on Twitter, follow them. Uh, and that's how a lot of people get into this. They, they they just see someone doing something interesting online and start following them and that's it, they're in the rabbit hole and then there's all sorts of other um, yeah, people who do this type of work. So um, yeah, I, I'm going to be biased and say join the, the Bellingcat Discord because there's so much cool stuff and interesting things going on in there. So yeah, please do. Um, I would also say as well, because this is... Um, this is uh, a presentation for, for for journalists in Africa and the African context. Please please do reach out. This is um, you know one of the one of the really great things about uh, the open source field is the the collaboration. And um, I also maybe this is a, a, an important point I should have made earlier that you know open source can take you so far. Sometimes you still need those traditional journalistic skills, and and in many cases the open source skill set is an extension of the traditional investigators skill set of just you know 
what where we're following the thread type thing. So uh, when those two things combine, it can be really, really, really powerful. Um, so if anyone is working on something or anyone has any ideas that they want to collaborate on, Bellingcat is always keen to do so. Um, and like I said at the start of the presentation, the more people who can learn these skills and do these things, I think it's better for journalism, better for society, more information gets out there to people. So that's something we really care about and are really passionate about and always try to be open to collaboration and to, to work with people. So, yeah. Perfect. Owen, would you be willing to once more share your email? Yes. Uh, so it's, reach out? Yeah, so it's um, just my name, Owen. E, it's the complicated spelling, so I'll spell it for you. E-O-G-H-A-N, A for Apple. Uh, at billingcat.com. Owen, thank you once again. Everyone, thank you for attending today. Um, I hope, you know, personally, I hope that we get a couple of OSIN investigation investigators that come out of this who get inspired and we get to do some more work. So we're going to let you um, get back to your day, Owen. Everyone, thank you once again. Um, and we will be posting on the IGNet Facebook group um, all the information from today when we get the chance. So... Thank you Thank once you again, and we're going to end it here. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.